Hello everyone and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Will Schick, I'm the head of studio for Atomic Mass Games, makers of the Marvel Crisis Protocol miniatures game. And today we have a really exciting one. We're going to be painting Bullseye on stream for everyone. So let's just dive right in and check him out. I'm going to get this camera off of my Londro dungeon. We're going to put it right here. This is our Bullseye ready to go. Uh, to start him off, we simply did our Zenith Prime. So... He was base coated or primed in a dark gray, and then I used a light gray spray paint from about 45 degrees on top. And as we talked about a lot, uh, this just really allows you to do a lot of things to um, bring out details and see shadows and highlights really fast. And we're gonna see how far we can get away with um, this Benjamin Poindexter today, how far we can knock him out. So I hope that all of y'all out there are having a great time, that you had a wonderful weekend and all that. The first thing I'm going to do to start this uh, villain off is I'm going to mix up a quick wash slash glaze of ink tense blue and some medium. And I just want to kind of do like a really thin undershade. And this is going to help when I apply my holder blue over the top to give us some additional shadows and definitions on everything. So. I'm going to dive right in and start coloring this in. I'm going to make sure that I stay on camera since I have this kind of new setup here. Um, so again, this is, this is just meant to be pretty thin. Like I just kind of want it to pool into those darker recesses. I want it to be pretty light on the top. And then I'm going to do my best to avoid hitting any of those white <clears throat> areas of the costume because we're going to do a very classic bullseye kind of interpretation here. So it's going to be a lot of white, a lot of blue, and not much else. Of course, for those who haven't seen, Josh posted up the rules for Kingpin, who we finished off painting on stream last week. Both Dallas and I did our versions. Um, super fun character, really exciting to kind of see everybody's reaction to the rules and, of course, the new affiliation. I've seen a lot of Black Cat love out there, so that's very exciting. Um, but yeah, Wilson Fisk, he was a fun one. Really interesting character to kind of dive into and work on for the game because I really wanted in his design to both represent his criminal mastermindness, but also to kind of represent his uh, impressive physicality too. Like one of the great things about a lot of the Wilson Fisk's appearances in comics, especially as they're setting up the character, is that you kind of see this big like round butterball of a man and everyone doesn't really take him seriously at first. They're like, oh, you know, he's, he's rich and he has all this clout, but clearly he's going to be a pushover. And then he always kicks the ever loving snot out of the hero characters at first. Cause they underestimate him. And he always makes some grandiose speech about how his body is like 90% muscle and how he's trained with all this stuff. And there's some great, um, moments where he's like training with his underlings and he's like, hit me harder. And they're not doing it. So all that stuff kind of led up to really wanting to encapsulate both sides of, of Wilson Fisk, the, really martial like he takes matters into his own hands like he didn't he didn't rise to his position through being nice and making friends he he rose there through a lot of like pretty nasty means um and of course he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with heroes quite a bit now he doesn't you know if he has his druthers right he's not going to do that because he's a smart man he knows he knows better but um kinds of things are really fun to bring into the character and they can add a lot of elements of interest and of course in a battle game you do you know unless a character has a specific support role um, like a Wong then you really want them to have their moment in the sun where they can go and help beat the tar out of somebody who's on a point that you want or anything like that um, so it also kind of led into making him more enjoyable on the tabletop more exciting to include in other affiliations like spider foes of which he is a part because he was introduced in spider-man he's been a classic spider-man villain for a long time was uh, a fabulous kind of antagonist to spider-man in the ultimate spider-man run that bendis did when they relaunched a whole bunch of the different characters and stuff so um you know having him kind of like throw his weight around to totally use a pun um was really fun and of course looking at what the criminal syndicate wants to do as an affiliation and stuff um, 
you know, we kind of knew as we were working on the Web Warriors, and I talked about this a little bit, we were brainstorming Web Warrior stuff and kind of trying to come up with what that affiliation stick was going to be and what the leadership was going to look like. And Josh, our fearless leader, Josh, was very adamant that uh, the Web Warriors needed to kind of be more objectively focused and really concerned with that great power and responsibility shtick. And uh, so that led to that leadership, and then that immediately got my wheels turning into, well, if that's what the web warriors do, then we all know what the criminal syndicate does, which is to make sure that uh, the web warriors don't get those those tokens and that stuff. And so the ability to hand off t tokens through illicit network and some other kind of like things like that became kind of a primary influence on criminal syndicate and of course they're thieves so token manipulation always made sense they're you know they want to get out there and steal things they want to um, strong arm people they're going to cause kind of havoc on that stuff so it was a fun it was a fun affiliation to work on uh, let's see so i'm going to I'm not using Holder Blue yet, Chewy, but I'm going to. So right now I'm just using uh, blue ink, thinned down to kind of a glaze to get a base layer on. And you'll know, you'll know when I uh, when I hit the the Holder Blue because it's going to be really bright. But I think first, so I'm going to take um, Miskatonic Gray, and we're going to bring those up just a little bit. Um, we're going to turn this into kind of a thinner, not quite a wash, but I just want to thin it down. And I'm going to go in and um, use it to hit all of the deep crevices on my whites, just to make sure that I get some nice um, differentiation and stuff in there. I don't have to be super clean with this. But this is just kind of going to help those deeper parts. So we get some darkness going on in those areas while we wait for our wash to well and truly dry. This is a great kind of like mid step. So again, I'm just kind of looking at doing what I did over the body, which is to glaze this on pretty thin so that it mostly runs into the cracks. Um, and then this will provide us a nice little foundation for doing our whites later and because this is a really nice light gray it's going to have a lot of contrast against the whites that we're going to use but it's not going to make putting those whites on extra difficult like trying to do say a white over a black or something like that or a darker color because whites don't have the best of coverage and as we've talked about before too we're not going to use a pure white except for like at the very end because white as a color is defined by its highlight or its sorry its shadow whereas black is defined by its highlight because white absorbs all the light spectrum so what you really see with white is whatever it refracts so um, if you really start to look at whites and things like that you'll notice that they all kind of have a different hue and a lot of that is based on the shadow itself so your extreme highlight is kind of your pure white and that's really minimal and then everything else is um, shadow and so the shadow obviously is not going to be pure white it's going to be a different color if you kind of master how to play with that you're going to wind up with really nice looking whites and they're going to look and they're going to be easier to paint and uh yeah it was ink tense blue from scale 75 for chewy who's asking on stream what kind of um, ink i use and i thinned it out a lot like a lot a lot okay so both sides rules, I mean, the panel to play went up, and I think it gives a pretty good indication of kind of where we la landed on Bullseye. One of the things that was fun about him was I, you know, there's, there's always characters that wind up getting more testing adjustments, less testing adjustments. You have your hits and your misses. Just kind of the nature of the game. But um, he was one of those characters where the testers were pretty much had minimal feedback as far as, like, what he did. And it was tweaking a little bit of, like, power level and balance. But... Um, he, he was he was the favorite three-pointer for quite a while in testing. So um, 
he does what he does very well. He throws he throws things at your face, and uh, he punishes you for attacking him back. And then, of course, the signature ability he talked about in the um, panel to play, I never miss. That was probably my that was the moment as I was writing up the little design brief for the character and stuff. And I was like, yes, this is bullseye. I had to get that in there. Um, and it becomes really defining. So now what I've done is I've taken my holder blue and I've thinned it out pretty nice into uh, a little bit of a wash, a little thicker than a normal wash. And I'm just going to kind of stretch it all over the blue outfit. And again, I'm going to be pretty careful as I go around to not hit any of those white areas but I can fix it if I mess up but the goal is definitely to make life easy on ourselves and not but I find that Bullseye really likes being in Cabal um, outside of like Criminal Syndicate he does pretty well in Spider Foes not so much of an Avenger but I think that makes sense Although, you know, you can find reasons to put things in anywhere. But he fills, fills some fun roles. And I think he plays against his uh, nemesis Daredevil in some fun manners, too. Just based on how we did Daredevil's rules and stuff like that. Which I'm sure Josh is uber excited to finally get to reveal at some point. Josh being our main daredevil man in the office. Let's grab some water. I'm going to thin this out just a little bit more. It's going on a little thick. Let's do some natural blending here. Again, just being careful. I'm just playing with the paint a little bit, making sure that um, it's not going on too thick, and then I'm taking up all the pools and stuff because I want, I really want to make sure that I'm maintaining those extreme highs on the character. Just a little bit more water. So this is kind of the fun part of um, painting is that you kind of have to play with your mixtures every time to make sure that you're getting kind of the opacity that you want or the translucency that you want. I'm making a mess. I should probably switch to a smaller brush. Just because this is always a different angle. I know I made a mess somewhere else, but that's okay. Just come in. So yeah, overall. I know, Simone, you, you can't miss the Holder Blue. It's the best part. The best part. Uh, so Zorganak, who's asking about Peter Parker on Defenders, that, that's just an error on the um, web doc, and we're going to get that fixed. So Parker is definitely part of the Defenders. He's got that long enough standing that we felt like he was worthy of inclusion on it. Um, especially that version of Parker. Let's come around the head. It's definitely time to replace this brush. Okay. Just zoning in here as I finish out these last little parts so that I don't wind up getting stuff all over the collar, which would be sad because that would just lead to a little bit more cleanup work for us. So there we go. So you can kind of see how, because of that undershade that we did, now the holder blue, like in the crevices, is extra blue because um, Halder has a little bit of a green tinge to it. So we have more blue to the depths, so we've kind of done natural shading now with that undertone, and then of course, um, as it stretches over the top of everything, 
like the pecs and things like that, we don't get a white. We instead still maintain that blueness to it. So there's that. And I think quick turnaround. Looks like I missed a little part on the leg. But yeah, it's a very contrast focused way of painting, you know, um, you're really just looking at kind of like cheating those cheating in quotes because there's no cheating in painting. Um, those highs and those lows really quick. This guy is not meant to go into a competition. He's meant for my shelf and for the gaming table. Um, so we just want, we want to get really good results nice and quick. And this is a great way to kind of like do that. And once this is dry, so now what I'm doing is I'm kind of just going in and pin washing into the crevices a little bit where I see that I want a little more color. Just get behind this leg here really quick. All right, and then we have this little flap and I'm not gonna try to use this brush because it wants to split on me. So I'm gonna switch to a different brush. Come in, we'll call it this spot right here. And the nice thing about this is like, if you do make mistakes or whatever, or you have like spillover, you can always go back with your base holder blue and kind of just more naturally paint it in and it'll be fine. Um, but don't be afraid especially when we move to our next step. Don't be afraid if it looks a little too light than what you want it, um, because it is easy to darken. It's, it's gonna take more work to lighten back up though. So you kind of want to maintain like on those upper sides of the arm and the, the biceps and things like that. Um, you want to maintain more of a white or like a translucency than you do um, a dark color because we're going to do a glaze over the top of this with some cyan ink once it's dry. And what that's going to do is it's going to add another tint to the whole surface and it's going to turn that holder blue a little bit more to the blue side, but it's also going to smooth out some of our transitions. So if things don't quite look even enough for you and stuff. Don't despair. You can always just do another layer of your pin wash which is effectively what we're doing here. Um, or, like for example, I pulled too much paint away from the back using my wet brush. So I can just add a little bit of blue and do kind of another layer and just darken it back up to where I'm happy with it. But again, I wanna just kind of watch and make sure that I'm getting those highs and those lows. And I think I'm pretty happy I just want to get under the neck a little bit more because that was difficult to do with the bigger brush. It just wasn't playing nice right now. I'm going to get across the nose. All right. So there's our holder blue done. Um, so we're good there. And now we'll move to our next color until that blue dries just to keep things moving. Although normally I'd give myself a little bit of time just to make sure. So I'm clean that out just a little bit. Um, so normally I'd work on a different project or take a few minutes, go get like a drink or a snack. Um, I'm going to move to Arctic blue though. And we're going to start working on the white parts of the, the costume and the reason I say I would take a little bit of a break is because normally what you'd want to do is just continue to work on the blue until it was done. So you have less chance for mistakes going over onto the white. Because it's going to be easier to fix the blue than it will be the white as we get moving. Um, but because we only have an hour and I want to go as far as we can, um, I'm just going to dive into doing my Arctic blue now. So Arctic blue is um, a really great color. We've used it a lot lately. It might be like right next to Halder Blue in terms of the number of times you've heard me say it. Um, but the thing that I really like about Arctic Blue is it's a nice blue-white. So it ties in really well with Haldra 
or any kind of like blue superhero costume. You want to look for those undertones. We've talked about undertones before to tie the composition together. So there's a lot of different ways to do color theory. Um, and I'm by no means an expert. I'm purely just a hobbyist who paints for fun and I don't do this professionally, shockingly enough. Um, weird, right? But if you can find colors that have similar undertones or complementary undertones, um, as well as another option of doing it, your, your whole like miniature, the whole look of the piece is gonna tie together much better. Um, and so this can be a really nice way of like kind of looking at the colors that you have and then choosing colors accordingly. And you'll find that you'll start to do this naturally as you learn the colors and like just naturally what looks good because our eyes are drawn to things that are compositionally nice. That's why, you know, really good artists are typically always seen as really good artists. They have an eye for it. They have training for it. And why you can teach classes on art and everybody kind of learns the same lessons because these lessons are universal to the human condition. Like our beloved T'Challa taught us far much more unites us than separates us and that is true in how we kind of see the world in colors and art too um, there's a lot of questions I need to jump on um, as far as Parker in Defenders uh, the chat's asking I like Parker um, I like current Spider-Man a lot I know that he's not everyone's cup of tea but for me he fits a play style that I really enjoy which is disruption um, Crisis Protocol, of course, is very narratively driven and objective focused, and there's a lot of different ways to approach how you do the objectives. Um, but for me, like Parker being able to pull people off of points to have his little web throw, which he can do from a pretty good distance away, uh, especially when you factor that into characters and how throws interact with characters. Um, he, can, he can really mess with your opponent's day, and then he's super fast. Um, you throw in like some of the defender signature spells for instance um, the pentagram of Ferala and now all of a sudden he's like zipping all over the place and just causing problems and um, impact webbing guarantees he's always going to have the one power to interact with the pentagram so there's a lot of neat things he can do um, and I, I very much enjoy him but I also enjoy him in Avengers um, I think he makes a pretty good web warrior Although I would say he's not my, not my personal favorite in Web Warriors. I, you know, it just makes sense to take him there, and he benefits. But I think his strengths are kind of, you know, that whole faction does what he does. So the places I really like to put Parker are the places that maybe lack some of that, because um, I think he just shines better in that in that instance. Uh, but it is a very different, like, it's a non-aggressive kind of way to play. It's it's more about getting your opponent kind of hot under the collar and annoyed, which is a classic Spider-Man ploy, um, which is probably why I also like that character and what he does. Uh, but he certainly is not, he's not a key that fits every lock. So I, I do think he has a place in Defenders. Um, it depends on your build and stuff, too, and what you're going for. But he can definitely do a lot of really good objective work. And if you absolutely need him to, he can certainly punch. I've sadly murdered a lot of people with my non-lethal taser, taser webs with some pretty uh, aggressive rolling. And that can always be funny too. Um, let's see. Height of the model on the base effect gameplay. Uh, no. Dave's mini art, it does not. There's no volume in this game. Height is abstracted into a stat number, if that's what you're asking. So um, it, it doesn't have a consequence. And what that allows us to do, and it was really important from the start, is we wanted to make the miniatures as cool and as dynamic and as awesome as possible, as well as making line of sight as simple and accessible for people as possible. This is a place where we thought we could do a lot of streamlining without impacting the narrative and the nature of the game so height is just a stat um so there's no volumes what matters is the base size you can't you can't alter the base size of a miniature so if it comes on a 35 it needs to stay on a 35 and that's because speed 
um, is really derived from that. Ranges of attacks are actually derived from that as well. Like the bigger your base, the more area you can threaten. So it extends the range of your attacks and that changes power levels and stuff like that. So you, know, you take a character like Thor and put him on a 65 millimeter base and um, you'll have a good time, but I don't think anyone else will either. So, so that, that's the more important thing. But otherwise, um, miniature height and all that stuff, like go crazy with the conversions because you don't have to worry about true line of sight nonsense or anything that, you know, changing the, the way in which your miniature is standing on the base is going to affect actual gameplay rules. Uh, and as, you know, a studio that loves the hobby and really enjoys painting and converting and modeling and all of that stuff. Um, that was a really important piece of the puzzle for us to make sure that, you know, everything was as accessible and hobby friendly as it could be. And that the game, you know, supported that and thrived from it. So there you go. Um, yeah, put Black Panther on a rock. As long as that rock's on a 35 mil, you're, you're good to go, my friend. You're good to go. Um, somebody asked a question about new OP kit. So as far as the um, organized play kits go for the moment, um, right now they're only available through distribution, which means that uh, you have to have your local game store order them uh, to get them. And, you know, the reason for that is that we don't, as Atomic Mass, we don't have any kind of like store system or anything like that that would allow us to disseminate kits in that kind of manner. And I think the other thing too is that, and I know this doesn't apply to everyone because your situations are all different, and I do, you know, apologize that there is no way for us to find the perfect like shoe fit for everyone but our retail like retail stores and local game stores are super important to communities to us as like a studio and everything else they they provide a lot of benefits in terms of being hubs of community centers and they do a lot of work on the ground to organize things and build communities around them and stuff um, even in these day and ages where the pandemic has really changed that and organized play is one of the ways in which we as a studio can really support that, can emphasize, you know, the nature of the store as a hub. And it's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship in a way. So, you know, we look at organized play as that too. It is, it is kind of a, a benefit that we create for retailers who want to support us to support them back and in turn support their communities. Um, but that doesn't mean that it'll always be that way, I suppose, you know, like the world is ever changing. Certainly um, the idea that our one day events would no longer be, you know, one big party celebration where everybody got together and played and instead became more of a, like a standard, like everything became more of a classic league feel where, you know, you, you would show up register and then play games over the course of a couple of weeks and maybe never all be together at once um, was not something that I was expecting to ever really be engineering or working on and that kind of stuff. So you never know, right? Um, obviously, I would love for everyone to have the opportunity to get a, get a hold of the materials in these kits because um, we work really hard on making them super awesome and expanding game content and stuff. Um, so I would love that everyone has the chance to get them, but you know, at the same time, there's a lot of other factors that go into it. And a lot of people who have um, different experiences and all of that. So it is difficult. I can't make everyone happy all the time, no matter how much I try. So all that's to say, um, for the moment, those organized play kits are only available if you have an LGS. They are available to all local game stores though who have any kind of contact with any kind of Asmodee distribution um, for their region. So anyone who sells Asmodee stuff and sells model requirements protocol stuff to local game stores can get your store that kit. And you know, hopefully the new nature of the way the organized play kits work is that even retailers who didn't 
have the space or the staff or whatever um, were prevented from kind of running more traditional organized play kits in the past, we'll see the value here because you don't need necessarily to have a ton of organized play event space or any at all. You know, if you as a retailer think it's better um, for players to simply register, get their materials and then play in different venues and then they can come back to you and they can say, okay, well, I played my game. Can I have my cool rewards? And you give them the rewards and you never have to organize anything directly in the store because that just doesn't work for your situation. And that's totally fine. And if, you know, you as the retailer are in a region and a place where you can have people in the store and you want to run it in a more traditional fashion, you can do that. It's all about, you know, options. And hopefully by opening up those options, you know, we can make sure that players who may not have had the opportunity before to partake in these kits can um, because of the flexibility that we're trying to put into these events now and how we're kind of encouraging retailers and stores to offer this stuff. So that's that. Um, let's see. Okay, so we've got our Arctic Blue pretty much everywhere we want it to go. I'm going to come in here. I'm just going to kind of like sketch out the collar. Um, I think I got all the questions, but the chat is kind of like rolling and rocking and rolling on me. So if I miss something, feel free to ask it again. And when I look up, I'll try to answer it. But yeah, Vibranium Heist is, um, well, let's talk about that a little bit because it's coming up. And uh, I know we haven't really done too much in terms of spoiling it outside of kind of what we talked about way back in March when it was originally supposed to hit. Um, but like, so the whole idea behind all of our organized play kits that we do at the store level and stuff is that they're play focused. So... There's no first, second, third place awards. Everyone just gets the exact same cool stuff for playing in games. So for um, example, in Vibranium Heist, the idea is, is that if a player signs up, you get all of the cool mission stuff, which is a unique game mission mode, which is asymmetrical. One player plays the heist team, which can be led, it doesn't have to be, but can be led by a unique event Eric Killmonger character and he's got a bunch of special rules and brand new abilities and stuff to kind of incentivize you know his role in this story in this narrative mission story so well you don't have to play with him you're probably gonna be pretty encouraged to play with Eric Killmonger because he's just kitted out to do well as the leader of the heist team you know based on the narrative um, and then the other player plays the security forces which are set to defend the, the Wakandan Vibranium Mine against, you know, exactly what's going to happen to it, which is thievery, undue thievery. Um, and I say it's asymmetric because, you know, in most games of Marvel Crisis Protocol, it's like, okay, we're going to play threat 17, 20, 19, whatever. And each side starts with the exact same amount of stuff. Vibranium Heist doesn't work that way. So Vibranium Heist, the defending player who plays the security forces, gets way more points than the poor little heist team. The difference is, is that when the game starts, the security forces are kind of not ready for the heist, so they're caught flat-footed, so that not everything starts on the table for the heist team, um, or for the security forces team, where the heist team starts off with all of their stuff. Now, as the game progresses, the heist team has to hack into computer, computers to get the secret vault codes, there's a potential that when they fail those, they're going to set off alarms. That's going to bring in more security forces, activate automated defenses, all this cool stuff. Um, and then once they have kind of like the codes and stuff, they have to go play a game of Yahtzee uh, to crack open the vaults. So you got to figure out the combinations on the vaults. And that's a fun little kind of like semi mini game that you can impact with rerolls and stuff based on how many computer consoles you've hacked and things like that. So once you get the vaults open, you can then steal the vibranium. And the game is scored based on how many pieces of vibranium the heist team can escape with. So uh, it's a variable. It's like there's not just a winner-loser. It's kind of like a 
you did really well because you got all the vibranium. You did okay because you got some vibranium. And then, you know, you did not that well at all because you got no vibranium. And then, of course, the security, de the security force is graded based on how many pieces of vibranium don't get escaped with. So it really changes kind of the nature of stuff. And then, of course, you have all these other rules and things. And so it creates this really fun narrative um, story that players get to tell out. And of course, who you take and what you do and how you decide to activate defenses and stuff like that. There's a little bit of luck, a little bit of skill, all that thing's going on. Um, but that mission is on an oversized mission card, kind of like how the ultimate encounters from Thanos are. If you have picked up Thanos or played the ultimate encounter. Um, so it's, it's, com it's completely usable after the event with all of your friends and you can play it whenever you want. So whenever you want a different game mode, you want to experience the Vibranium Heist game mode, you just plug it in and you can play with all your different stuff and with your friends and all of that. So this kind of ties back into the overall point of our organized play, which is again, play focused, but it's also really meant to expand game options and, and game modes. So we want to make sure that you all as players have a lot of different opportunities to experience the stories of Marvel and the Game of Crisis Protocol in some unique ways. So we started kind of outlining that a little bit with the Ultimate Encounters, and then we showed you what Ultimate Encounters look like, and that's a very specific game mode that kind of turns the experience in a different way. And um, organized play is gonna be kind of like the consistent way in which we offer that. So we've got lots of cool stuff in the works. You know, we're working on uh, free-for-all multiplayer game modes that are just pandemonium and super fun. We're working on more ultimate encounters. We're working on more narrative missions. Um, we have kind of league events, which have more sweeping, grandiose um, game effects and all that. So while you get really cool alternate art card rewards for playing in Vibranium Heist, you get one for playing as the security force. You get one for playing as the heist team. Um, you can also earn uh, an alternate art recalibration matrix card for playing a game with a fully painted squad, whether on the security force or on the heist team. Um, you know, you're going to get all this cool stuff. To, to us, the real value is the game materials, right? Because these are all just, they're just mini game expansions that only increase the options, the playability, everything that you can do with these super awesome Marvel Miniatures and this really awesome Marvel Miniatures game. Um, and so for me, that's the really exciting part to everything that we're doing. And I'm really excited for you all to see um, where we're going with this in the coming year and how it ties into characters and themes and all of this stuff. So we're gonna have a lot of fun. It's gonna be really cool. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. Even if you've never played Organized Play before, uh, you should give ours a try because it's gonna be very different. And hopefully it'll be like, you know, no other organized play program that you've experienced in terms of like what it's offering and the point behind it. And the point behind organized play as far as I'm concerned and everyone in the studio is concerned is to bring people together so that we can play games and have fun. Um, and that's it. And we just want to enjoy each other's time and we want to enjoy the game and see it grow and, you know, be exciting and all that stuff. Oh, who's my favorite Pagani or Dallas? And it depends what I need. If I if I need a miniature sculpted, my favorite's gonna be Dallas. If I need a if I need a crazy rules design developed, it's gonna be Pagani. So it can it can go left or white or right here. Um, okay, so I have now taken my cyan ink, which is another ink tense color. I've turned it into a glaze, which means that I've thinned it down a whole, whole lot. So what I'm looking for here is I'm using medium and water, and I just want it to be a very even kind of like tinting coat. Um, so I can maybe show you my thumb here. Whoop. So you can see how thin that is and how it's just kind of totally tinting my thumbnail into that color. So that's a glaze. Now, if it was a wash, it would of work a bit more like this where it would be a bit thicker 
You can see, see the difference? So see how this just tints evenly all over and this wash really wants to run into the imperfections in my fingernail. So all the little striations as my, in my, in my nail, that natural nail bed, like it's pooling in those pools. So it's, it's a lot darker and it's running in those spots where this is really even. So glaze, wash. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go into the glaze and I just wanna go, and I'm gonna go over the entire blue and hopefully as I do this, you're gonna see how that glaze immediately kind of impacts the tone of our Holger blue. And it is gonna give us a little more definition in those dark areas. I do want to be somewhat careful as I go around here not to get it on my white. Um, and again, you want this to be very thin and you want the coverage to be really, really even. And the thing with a glaze is that, you know, keep it super thin. And if you want to amp up the effect, do another glaze layer. Um, you know, Dallas can talk to you about his crazy times as a professional studio painter and painting reds, which use a lot of glazes to get those effects that you see on really high end, like cover miniatures and stuff that show up on boxes that have a lot of reds. Um, the process of getting like a really good true red in a paint job pretty much involves, you know, 12 to 15 layers of red glaze. Um, so it's a patience game. It's definitely like one of those where get a hair dryer if you're gonna like really go crazy with it um, so that you can speed up your drying times because drying times will kill you when it comes to the level of glazes because they're really thin they take a long time to dry so all those things kind of factor in but you know glazing can be used for so many cool things it can be used on flames to get really nice like bright flame colors and you can tint start with a yellow and use a red or an orange glaze and tint it down into that more like fire color there's you can use purples over pinks you can use blues over greens all like the it's endless endless the uses for glazes are endless so um, and on this bullseye here I really don't feel like we're gonna need to do more than one glaze but we'll kind of start working on that white a little bit as the blue dries and we'll go from there um, so there's just a lot of a lot of potential with glazes and they work well with other techniques like washing and stuff to really pump up that vibrancy. Um, and they just kind of like bring your colors into that next level and they help, again, what this glaze is really doing is it's tinting me more back towards that blue color, which I want out of the, the bullseye suit. And it's also helping to kind of amp up the contrast between our darker parts of the holder blue and our brighter parts of the holder blue and all that. So there we go. That's it with the glaze. And as that dries, it's going to start to get going. So all right, so we're going to go back. I'm going to fix this little blue spot here. All right, I'm going to go back to our white. I'm going to take my Arctic blue. Yoink. I'm going to find an open spot on my well here. I'm going to take, um, for this, I'm actually going to use just pure white. And I'm going to start mixing in pure white with my Arctic blue. And then I'm just going to really carefully um, start building up my white in a very classic kind of highlight. Um, sort of way with layers. So I'm going to thin this out just a little bit because I want it to be pretty smooth as it goes on. A little bit more white. A little bit more white, if you will. All right, I'm gonna switch. So I'm gonna keep my clean brush in my mouth. Um, you can keep it accessible anywhere you want, but I find that 
after years of Dallas training, keeping it in my mouth is the best spot to allow for quick transitions. And I'm gonna do that and keep it close by because if I make a mistake, um, I can use it to quickly correct and blend out any mistake that I make. Um, and then otherwise I'm gonna to shift to my zero size brush because it's just gonna give me the most control here. It's got the best tip on any of the paint brushes that I have right now. And I'm just gonna come in and I'm gonna start building up my white highlights. And again, this is a pretty traditional way of doing it in terms of layering. So I'm just kind of like looking for those spots that are raised and hitting those with the color. And then I'm leaving the shadows or the depressed areas um, a little darker. And I'm just working these paints while they're wet to build that up. And if you keep your paints thin enough, especially working with whites, it can get really like thick and goopy on you. So use a little bit of medium or water, make sure that it's going on really smooth. Then you don't even really have to, um, you know, do the full like paint the lines. You can just tap and let the capillary action of the paint itself do a lot of the work for you. Um, so minimizing your brush strokes by using a thinner paint that's gonna flow really well off the tip can be a good way to avoid brush strokes on paints like whites or primary yellows that really like to get streaky. Um, but you do have to keep that paint really thin because otherwise it's gonna goop on. You don't want that either. And then the other thing you can do is you can grab your clean brush and you can blend out those streaks too if you need to. Um, but really what we're doing is we're just trying to hit the highs. And then I'll use my other brush to kind of blend out into the shadows. Get some smooth transition. this process can kind of take as many or as few steps as you want until you're happy with it. Um, and you can keep blending up, of course, with more and more white added to the base mixture. It just really comes down to how much how strong you want that pure white effect to be because we're kind of going a little comic booky on this bullseye here I think we want it to be pretty pretty white so And a wet palette, if you have one, will really help keep your paints moisturized and smooth. So it can be a really good tool in working with colors like this that you want to keep, you know, pretty thin and smooth. Um, if you don't have one, that's okay too. It's not a huge deal. Like I don't have one right now. So I'm just making sure to clean my brush several times in between working the color so that I don't get dried paint on my brush. And I'm just adding a little bit more water to my palette whenever I feel like the paint is getting a little thick. Otherwise, 
and we're just blending out the white, thinking about where those colors are. And of course, another part to it is that you can kind of like think about where, you know, this boot right here is very much in shade since it's bent forward, so you don't even have to muss with that. We can just leave that as our darker white color. Um, and furthermore, no one's really gonna see it. When they look at the miniature, we talk about like where the eye's gonna go and stuff like that. So. Tops of these fingers, draw those out. So with bullseye here, like really all I'm doing is I'm just trying to follow the lines on his segmented gloves and costumes. And I'm trying to leave the dark lines alone so that I can get that nice separation that you see there. And I'm just hitting kind of the upper middle part with my brighter color. Um, you know, to really make that segmentation pop, you wanna highlight the bottom half of each band because the way the light would hit it, if you think about it being segmented, you wanna accentuate that dark line. So having a bright line above it is gonna really help that dark line pop and it's gonna help that separation. So I come over here, hit this. this I'm just gonna blend it down because again no light would really hit under there so I don't have to worry about that part I just want to make sure that transition looks kind of smooth so I don't have a really hard line so I'll just use my blending brush for that come over come over so again like we did a lot of pre-work on these colors like using our glazes and our washes at the start along with our zenith prime to really help us get to a point where we don't have to do a lot at this stage to see some pretty nice results uh, so again i'm just using this other brush to kind of blend out my colors a little bit and here comes this fun one so the collar obviously is going to be one of those trickier moments where you're going to have to take your time and be steady, steady yourself up. And just have that blending brush ready. Look right there, I went under the shoulder. You can see it, so I'm going to use my blending brush to come right up to where I like messed up and just kind of like scrub away my mistake, just erase it. Flip them over here. So again, you know, you can see how I'm embracing my hand with the brush against both the stand and my other thumb. Find the position that works well for you and that you just feel really comfortable in to where you're steady and you're getting that support. And Dallas mentioned it on his last stream, but the worst thing you can do at this point is holding your breath. I know it's kind of the natural inclination is like, oh, I won't shake if I hold my breath, but your body kind of goes into panic mode because it loves oxygen. So holding your breath can actually like cause more stress and then that'll cause you to shake more. So if you really need to like steady yourself, use the old take a deep breath, exhale halfway, and then on the halfway point, that's when you make your move. But really, if you have good stability, like I'm using my forearms on my chair and my desk, my thumb or my pinky right here, 
my thumb right there. Um, I have all the stability I need to be able to do this delicate kind of like line work. And it's also a little bit of like practice and control. Um, you know, mistakes will happen. I'm probably going to make some now. That's okay. We can always fix mistakes. But what you can't do is you can't get better if you don't let yourself make mistakes in the first place. So there's that collar. Now we're just going to come in and hit his little rings. Oh, we might be able to get him to tabletop here in an hour. Wouldn't that be amazing? I'm just going to come back in. I'm going to hit that. Get this leg really quick. All right. So I'm just kind of going back through and using the same white and just kind of amping up some of those highlights. Come in here, use my other brush, blending out my white, coming over the top, kind of hitting that in, my white. Our belt is a little messy right now, but that's okay. No one's really going to see that, and we can always go back in and fix it. So I'm feeling pretty happy with that as far as like a tabletop standard goes. We've got some nice lining between our whites, which you can see once my hand's back there. Some really nice blue going on, so we really just have to hit the face. So we're just gonna grab some middle flesh tone. I believe it's called, uh, what is it? Pink Flesh from Scale 75. Just gonna grab a little bit of it. It's gonna come in, and we know that his nose is showing because no one wants their nose covered as they do their stuff. I'm doing my best to kind of avoid the mouth, although I can fix that later as well. There's that. And I'm not even gonna bother with the eyes um, as far as like getting the flesh tone in there because I don't think it's gonna be as important. We just keep it dark. Uh, Cause I'm pretty happy with that. Cause we have so much of our Holder Blue and our inks and stuff in there that it's nice and dark. Do you notice that I want to come in here and hit this because there's a little bit of spot that we missed, but this is the benefit of having really thin paints. They take forever to dry, so get in there and hit by his thigh so we get the separation there. Come back over here, just kind of deepen up this color here. Go through and run. You get a little line right there. And then we'll get under the chin a little bit. And it looks like we got to get this little chin cap here. There we go. Alright, there's our bullseye. So, I think the last little bit that we'd want to do, 
So I'm going to grab some white sands. No, Mojave white, which is a nice little tooth color. So it's a very yellow white. Grab that. We're just going to carefully come in. Right in here. I'm just going to draw that out. Get those little teethers kind of colored. And then once we have the teeth colored, we can grab our flesh wash, which is a Vallejo flesh wash. Just basically all ready to go. And we're just gonna Kind of smoosh that in to the crevices in the corner. And because we have that different color on the teeth, we can just kind of go over that with this kind of yellow brown flesh wash. And it should pick out those teeth nice for us. And if we really wanted to, we could go into the eye sockets too with it, just to give us a little bit of that brownness. Help separate them even more from the mask. Really want that to pool on the corners to really get some stuff going on. All right. And let's see if we can, now that I'm not maneuvering him around so much, let's get a little zoom in on this guy. Kind of our bullseye in an hour. So overall, for the, about 60 minutes of work, super happy with where he turned out. I'd be more than happy to finish off the base. Technically, I have to do the knives. I know, I know. Shh. Here. Josh can't turn me off right now. I think he's on vacation anyway, so. Hold on. We'll get this done. We'll make it official. We'll make it official. Take some of our black metal. Knives, pistol, front of pistol, there. Whoop, zone in. There we go. There is our bullseye <laughs> with knives and gun complete. Now, of course, I'd go back through and wash um, the knives, and I'd probably do another layer of the white. Um, you could also go through, add a little bit more of definition to the suit by taking some halter blue, mixing in with some white, making those little stretch marks that we like to do to just to show the fabric. But again, uh, really pleased with how this turned out for the hour that we spent on it. Hopefully it's giving you some ideas on how to create some really great effects by going pretty quick. Uh, superheroes, especially Marvel characters, are really great for this type of painting as well because um, you've got those big broad surfaces that have a lot of detail but are very simple to paint using pin washes and stuff like that. Uh, so there you go. All right, let's hop off. Him. let's go to this and we'll see all these lights in my face so there you go i hope that all of y'all out there uh, enjoyed that little stream and kind of are inspired to put paint on your own bullseye uh, whether you use this scheme or something else that uses similar techniques our goal is always to teach you uh, how to paint not what to paint so put your own uh, spin on it find your own version of the character that's always the most exciting part when it comes to any hobby miniatures game and especially something as iconic as marvel um, be sure to check out our hashtag painting protocol challenge for this month. If you haven't submitted something yet, please do so. We love seeing all of your entries uh, and the staff really wants to have a big collection to pick from because we just love looking through all of the work that you all are doing out there. 
um, and seeing the amazing uh, paint jobs and just seeing inspiring hobby stuff all the time. It's amazing. So hop on Instagram, post up your Spider-Verse. So Spider-Foes, Spider-Man, Spider-Woman, Spider-Girls, Ghost Spiders, uh, Spider-People. Um, but post up those on the Instagram using hashtag uh, painting protocol. I lost it there for a second. And uh, we'll be checking those out at the end of the month. So you've got a couple weeks, week and a half left, I guess, at this point um, before we're quite there. So again, thank you all for joining me. I uh, hope to see you on the next one. Be sure to check in on Thursday at 1 p.m. for another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live, uh, where we'll be putting more paints on more Marvel Crisis Protocols miniatures. Otherwise, till then, stay safe, have a wonderful time, and be great to each other. Goodbye.